Uh, we predict, provide predictive analytics mainly to uh, car manufacturers, but manufacturers actually of all types of products, um, to help them understand uh, from initial data how well their products are going to perform in the field at 12 months of ownership all the way out to the end of life of the vehicle or the product. So DPU 2 cost, it's, it's a first time um, that we've been able to bring together millions and millions of service records and repair orders throughout the United States to really look for the first time what the true cost is, what's the actual spending on parts and components and laborers as customers bring their vehicles in for service at a dealership or at a service facility across the U.S. For more than a decade, we predict has been working with manufacturers, captive finance companies, suppliers, fleet companies, and others to provide a unique view of their own field data, combining our exclusive and validated forecasting methodology with warranty and customer pay service records across the industry allows a first time view of competitive predictive component performance. These insights save our clients millions of dollars on warranty, cut costly repairs, and galvanize their customer reputation. Our predictive insights reveal how each component and each vehicle will perform today, in 30 days, in one year, in five years, allowing our clients to become smarter businesses on many fronts, such as improved quality, increased dealership and after sales opportunities, aligned appropriate accruals and cash flow, stabilized balance sheets with our insurance coverage, personalized with telematic data and prioritize the service claims that most impact customer satisfaction. Accelerate towards certainty. Hi everyone, welcome to the first afternoon session on uh, building sustainable cities through smart technology. I have four excellent panelists here today, and uh, I will introduce them, and they'll each speak for a few moments, and then we'll have a great Q&A session. So you, as they speak, please start to uh, put your Q&A into the, into the Q&A on the app, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So our first presenter is Gabe Klein. He's a partner of CityFi. And uh, I've known him for quite a few years since uh, my time in Columbus on the Smart Columbus Project. He spent his career as an entrepreneur, both in private sector and government, focused on the best outcomes he can produce for people. As a former commissioner of the Chicago and Washington, D.C. Departments of Transportation, he embraced new integrated policies, technologies, and process improvements while focusing on putting people and the planet first versus automobiles on city streets. This included launching two of the first and largest bike share systems in the US and building protected bike line, lanes and better pedestrian infrastructure for vulnerable citizens citywide, as well as facilitating or building high quality transit and shared mobility services that could help each city's mobility goals. As commissioner, he worked to revamp public spaces and bring a new river walk to Chicago, as well as the breathtaking Bloomingdale Trail, 100 miles of bike lanes, and less sexy behind the scenes revamps for parking, permitting, and many other arcane government processes that translates to better operations and budget for city priorities. Gabe honed his creativity and leadership skills working in business, including Zipcar, where he served as vice president, Bikes USA as the national director of stores, and his own electric powered organic food truck chain on the fly. Gabe, to you. Thank you, Carla. Can you hear me okay? Very well. Great, and great to be with you today and everybody there. Uh, thanks for allowing me to come uh, remotely for this. Um, that was a perfect setup because what I want to uh, talk about is how the world is really centering around outcomes. And when I say the world, I mean corporate America, I mean uh, national governments, I mean local governments, NGOs, philanthropy. We've got a few big issues and they happen to mirror, I think, um, what the uh, uh, Biden-Harris team, you know, what their po policies are around climate, um, around equity, 
and around um, jobs and opportunity and, and, and access, really, which is related directly to transportation. Um, I was lucky enough to, to actually serve on the transition uh, for transportation. And so it did really um, give me a unique opportunity uh, to look at outcomes filtered all the way down to industry incentives, consumer uptake, uh, and, and so forth. And I think we need to move much faster towards solving you know, these problems than we traditionally have, which means government and private NGOs need to come together to make this big directional change as large and as fast as humanly possible. And technology is going to be key to both, uh, large and fast, but only when merged with really smart policy. And um, I think also what you're seeing is that we can't look anymore at each of these components, uh, these key components in a silo. Everything is interrelated. And a great example, I think, I was thinking today, what am I going to talk about as an example? Electrification. We had some great announcements today uh, uh, from, from the president. You know, it's very clear. We need some carrot and stick. We need push and pull. We need incentives and regulations. We need a consumer focus and an industry focus. So, you know, mileage, mileage standards are going to go back up. Uh, pollution rules get put in place. Costs to industry of noncompliance become insurmountable. I mean, that's sort of what needs to happen. Um, but also the federal government has the power to create the marketplace for the demand with their own purchases, with uh, tax incentives for companies, um, with consumer tax uh, in incentives or rebates. But um, the ugly truth is, you know, we get so caught up in like electric cars, we need to cut in half our production of automobiles, according to the Rocky Mountain in Institute, to really win this environmental battle. So, you know, at, at its heart, I think our consumption levels, particularly in the U.S., but really worldwide, are sort of out of control. Um, and individual ownership of assets, and not just cars, but cars in particular, as the largest emitter of CO2, are literally killing us. So we can no longer you know, use single occupancy vehicle trips for trips less than a mile. And you know, INRIC's uh, research, um, they looked at this and they said of over 50 million trips in a single month in the 25 most congested US cities, they found that 48% of all car trips are less than three miles in length, with about 20% being shorter than one mile. And I would remind people that we have the biggest obesity problem in the world, and we're the richest country in the world. So you start to put it all together and, again, stop looking in silos and connect these things together to get healthy, to save the planet, to create opportunity and jobs. We need to get a handle on this because it taxes our system, it taxes our environment, but also... From an equity standpoint, it taxes our most vulnerable citizens' pocketbooks. So we really need to start trading out this individual capital burden that we've gotten used to uh, here in, in the U.S. for modern shared mobility and transit systems. Um, and of course, we need to reform our land use patterns, which, which is also a big issue. Um, but this will give our citizens the ability to invest in education, to invest in housing, to invest in savings. And, you know, things like the concept of universal basic mo mobility are now being looked at uh, very seriously, just like universal basic income uh, by people in the tech sector in particular, as well as government. Because when you give people access to transportation, just as we assume they should get with healthcare and education, or a lot of people do, um, you open up you know, um, lanes of opportunity for people. So what other technologies are needed? Uh, you know, we need scooters, we need e-bikes, we need software to manage uh, grid demand. We need battery recycling systems. We need multimodal hubs and the associated charging systems for everything, 3D printing of components. We need new modular design standards and much more. And we need a great education system to power these as U.S. jobs. So basically, there's a huge economic opportunity here. But the other choice we can make is we can keep burning fossil fuels, which in my mind is the new cigarette, and that has sailed. And, uh, you know, hopefully the burden of ownership um, is next, and that will go away. But it'll only work with the right policies, the right land use patterns, and a critical mass of adoption, like you see in Singapore and other places. So that's my message today, and hopefully technology can help us to catch up, uh, because we desperately need to. Thank you. Thanks, Gabe. I, I have a ton of questions for you, but I'll, I'll hold those for later. Um, our second panelist is uh, Heather Wilberger, Senior Vice President and CIO for Bedrock. She's Bedrock's first CIO responsible for overseeing 
and managing the information technology team and all strategic technology acquisitions for the company. Since its founding, Bedrock and its affiliates have invested and committed more than $5.6 billion to acquiring and developing more than 100 properties, including new construction of ground-up developments in downtown Detroit and Cleveland, totaling more than 20 million square feet. Heather brings to Bedrock more than 15 years of experience in information technology, both in the public and private sectors. Her specialties include minimizing redund redundancies, designing, implementing, and managing networks and software as it relates to property management, acquisitions, and development. Before coming to Bedrock, the newly minted Michigan resident was most recently the CIO for a large-scale residential and commercial property management firm on the West Coast. So boy, I'd like to ask a lot about that transition, but to Heather and your opening comments, please. Yeah, no, so th I think I've got to get my bio a bit up to date because I've been here for about three years. And I think the piece that's really important for me and for Bedrock is when we think about smart city infrastructure design, it's about creating economic opportunity. And Bedrock is in a really unique position to be able to think strategically, strategically about the deployment of technology and mobility in our developments. And to be part of something like that, frankly, is what drew, what drew me from the West Coast. I came from a beautiful place called Oregon. And I always joke when people find out that, that I came out from the West Coast, that that's the opposite direction that people tend to migrate. They tend to migrate to Oregon. I couldn't be happier to be in Detroit and to be part of what we are really trying to do and to be able to provide opportunities to technology and open up access to the, to the communities that we serve. Well, thank you so much. Um, and you said what city in Oregon? Portland. Oh, I know that city well. I had a son that lived there, so I have questions about that too. Um, our third speaker is someone I know well, Mandy Bishop, the program manager for Smart Columbus. She serves as the deputy director of public service assigned as the Smart Columbus program manager. Mandy joined the city of Columbus in July of 2017 and she has 22 years of industry experience with an emphasis on complex project management to lead the delivery of the USDOT Vulcan and American Climate Change Challenge grant funded programs. She also oversees finance, human resources, and Vision Zero for the department. She has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from The Ohio State University and is, is a registered Ohio professional engineer. She's also a Women's Transportation Seminar, Columbus Engineers Club, and American Society of Highway Engineers member. She has a passion for engineering solutions to societal, societal challenges, leveraging technology and innovation. Mandy. Carla, it's great to, great to be here virtually. Um, the Smart Columbus program really focused on future-proofing our economy through sustainable transportation like electric vehicles and uh, sustainable mobility solutions like our trip planning app, Pivot. Um, I'm gonna take most of my time and share a video with the group to really show how the program impacted our economic competitives, competitiveness and really created a, a platform to help connect more people into our transportation system and create more opportunity. 2016, Columbus won the $50 million Smart City Challenge, a chance to test the newest transportation technologies to make our city safer and more sustainable, while also preparing for growth and creating opportunity for residents. Every sector of our community rallied to win the challenge and to turn it into a launch pad that would make Columbus an epicenter of mobility innovation. Since winning the challenge, we've deployed the most robust portfolio of groundbreaking mobility technologies of any city in the country. And we've done it in partnership with more than 100 partners and in collaboration with over 100,000 residents. We've deployed autonomous vehicles to connect residents to services and tested how connected vehicles can make our streets safer. We've created tools to make it easier to navigate transit and increased electric vehicle adoption to ready our city for the future. And we did it all with people in mind, using these tools to create access to jobs and healthcare and to reduce emissions 
and fight climate change. Thanks to the Smart City Challenge, we've attracted investment to the region and worked to reduce congestion so our city can grow smarter. Working together, we've created pathways to prosperity for our residents. Thanks to the Pivot app, I'm able to get myself to and from work as an essential worker easier than ever using a bus and scooter. Food deliveries from the Linden Leap helped ensure that our neighbors got the nourishment they needed to stay safe and healthy. Working as an operator for the Linden Leap not only equipped me with a unique skill set, it allowed me to serve my community and gave me the means to provide for my family when I needed it the most. The Wayfinder app, it helps me get around the city better. As Jose's travel partner, it's been incredible to see him experience places like the North Market for the first time. Finding a parking place through Park Columbus before I leave home gives me peace of mind when I'm heading downtown or to the short north. The safety alerts were helpful. It made me aware of some things I wouldn't have noticed otherwise. It made me feel safer as I took my granddaughter back and forth to dance every day. Through the Smart City Challenge, we helped connect residents with opportunity and created a roadmap that cities around the country can follow. Today, mobility innovation is thriving in our city. The challenge harnessed Columbus's collaborative spirit and inspired innovation throughout our region. Smart Columbus challenged us to think differently about how we get to work and how we design our work environment. We've applied what we learned in Columbus to projects in 20 other cities nationwide. We've gained valuable insight from Rides for Baby and are now expanding same-day transportation benefits to better serve our clients. Thanks to the Smart Cities Challenge, we're becoming a city of the future, recognized globally for innovation, giving us an edge over cities for investment, development, and talent. Columbus now leads the nation for autonomous vehicle research and real-world deployments, attracting even more activity to the region. We're making unprecedented investments in electric vehicle infrastructure and renewable energy, changing our region's trajectory for greenhouse gas emissions. We're building from the lessons of the challenge to transform other aspects of our community, using technology and data to improve access to food, job training, and other critical community services. Together, we've uncovered new ways to create opportunity and improve quality of life for our residents. Moving forward, Smart Columbus will look beyond mobility, anticipating what's new and next at the intersection of technology and community good, so that we can address some of our community's most pressing challenges, from access to jobs, to digital connectivity, to climate change. Columbus, thank you for innovating with us through this incredible opportunity. We look forward to working with you to continue to become a modern and thriving city. Everyone has a role to play so that we can create prosperity and together transport our city to the future. So I hope many of you uh, take away that it really takes a village. It takes, um, as Gabe pointed out, it takes uh, the, the government sector, the private sector, the, the nonprofit sector to really get engaged. And we have to engage with our most vulnerable residents to really understand the challenges that we face. Uh, but technology can really drive sustainability in a community in a number of different ways. And so I look forward to being on the panel today and talking more about that. Well, thanks so much, Mandy. It was good to see a lot of old friends there in that video. Um, our next panelist is Justine Johnson. She is mobility strategist for Ford City Solutions. She's a proud native of Los Angeles, California. And for the past eight years, she resided in New York City working on transportation initiatives under the Bloomberg and de Blasio administrations. While at the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission, she worked on the Boro Taxi Initiative, also known as the Green Taxi Program, which created a new for hire vehicle and driver classification. Following her work at the TLC, she moved to the New York Economic Development Corporation managing government and community relations for Mayor de Blasio's new commuter ferry system called NYC Ferry. In 2018, she joined Ford Mobility's City Solutions team and is working with municipalities and communities on mobility solutions that help move people and goods more efficiently and effectively throughout the region. Justine holds a bachelor's degree from Hampton University and two master's degrees from the University of Southern California. Justine. 
Thank you so much, and thank you so much to the Center for Automotive Research for having me here today, um, and just for everyone being in attendance. Uh, for those who may be online, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for those around the world who might be watching. Um, this particular topic today is um, more than important, not only for me personally, but also um, within Ford um, AV and Mobility. Um, I have the pleasure of really working closely with a dynamic team in a very broad area of mobility and really talking about the ecosystem of mobility. Um, some of the products within Ford AV and Mobility include um, micromobility, uh, and our micromobility business is Spin Scooter. Um, so essentially when folks ask me, what is micromobility? I always say, think about that first and last mile. What does that one to three mile radius look like and how do you you move within that space and what other options do you have? So the uh, micromobility space is very exciting for me. Um, also another product that we have in microtransit is our um, business through Transloc, um, really having a conversation about fixed and on-demand transit routing. We work really closely um, with municipalities and as well as with private organizations like colleges and as well as hospitals um, and a variety of other spaces to really think about um, offering different types of services on a shuttle or on a bus. And so um, also when you talk about what does micro transit mean in terms of mileage, I always say like, let's go to somewhere between three to six miles, something where it might be too hard for you to walk, but um, you know, actually having a bus or a shuttle to move you to a location is also really important to this broader conversation about transportation and mobility. Um, also, we have a product within Ford Mobility called Safety Insights. Um, and Safety Insights is a commercially available product, um, essentially that looks at connected vehicle data to really understand the vulnerabilities within the transit network. Where might there be activities where there is extreme acceleration or extreme braking, and how might you be able to identify some of the near misses. Um, it's really important that we talk about safety within our full transportation system um, because it is very important. There are many lives that are lost every year on our roadways and our streets, and we have to do more to make sure that we're, we're really putting our best effort forward to really reducing um, and really eliminating a lot of the fat fatalities that do happen. And lastly, the fun and exciting topic is always autonomous vehicles, um, and so really proud to work with a really great team that's doing some dynamic work in cities like Washington, D.C., and in Austin, Texas, and as well as um, Miami. So I'm um, very happy to be here today and look Looking forward to this conversation. Well, thanks for those great opening comments. And I'm going to start with a question. Uh, I am getting some from the audience, so please keep sending more, though. A question that uh, I know all four of you have something to say about. And um, uh, Mandy and uh, Gabe, you may not have seen the announcement that happened at lunchtime, or maybe you did, about the Detroit Smart Parking Lab, which is a collaboration between um, the state and uh, Bedrock and Ford. But it's a great example of a public-private partnership, as is Smart Columbus and some of the work that I know Gabe's been involved in. And my question is, you know, why do we have to have a public-private partnership? What makes that, what's that secret sauce? What makes that tick and work well? What are some great projects that we can reference that have been as a result of an excellent private partnership? public partnership. And I'm going to first start with the folks on the stage here because I want them to explain it in terms of the announcement today. And then uh, for Mandy and Gabe, you know, what are some other great examples? I know Columbus was a great example, so maybe you can tell us, Mandy, why that secret sauce works so well. And Gabe, you can talk about some of your work also. So either one of you that wants to start, Justine or Heather, please go ahead. Yeah, so just I'm, I hope everyone had a moment to, to see Whitmer, uh, the, the speech she gave and the announcement that we shared with everyone today that Bosch, who's been an incredible partner, Ford and uh, the American Center for Mobility and Enterprise as our first uh, incredible technology deployment and testing in our smart parking lab, which is an open and innovative approach to thinking about what problems is parking have that might need to be solved. Um, I think that 
People like to drive, I think as Trevor said earlier, but nobody likes to park. The amount of emissions that are put into the atmosphere because of the idling and the searching for parking spaces is a driving force for folks at Bedrock and myself to, to understand how can we, A, make it a better consumer experience, a better customer experience, a tenant, tenant resident, a visitor experience to park their, their car quickly but the wonderful outcome that we hope to see are advances in sustainability in the parking spaces so that we can get folks parking their car quickly, hopefully with some really great and wonderful autonomous vehicle technology, and reduce that idling that's happening uh, as people are driving around a city trying to find parking. So it's a wonderful collaboration, public partnership with, I mean, the state of Michigan's very, very involved. Um, and I think for us, it worked really well because we have different levels of expertise. We've got, you know, the, the Ford, uh, the cars we're using in this space. We've got Bosch technology, Ford technology. Uh, Enterprise has, an, has their wonderful idea to, to think about how to revolutionize that experience when you drop your car off in an airport. We have the American Center for Mobility who brings to the table, a, you know, a wonderful experience in operating these sort of things and then incredible buy-in and support from the state to think about what sort of things will have to change if these things are successful. And without that sort of public-private partnership, this wouldn't make any sense for Bedrock to be involved. We're a real estate developer, we're really keen to do certain things, but it's much more successful when we have these partners in technology, we have these partners at the state. Uh, the amount of buy-in and the future success and, uh, and hopefully the the economic attraction it creates for folks seeing these innovations happening in Detroit will drive folks to our city. So with that, I'll pass it to you. And just to piggyback off of that, I think um, it's an exciting time to see the real estate community, the automotive sector, you have public sector um, leaders as well having a conversation about mobility. And I think it's it's really groundbreaking when you think about this level of, of detail and conversation that has to go into work like this. I think, you know, it's one thing to say, let the industry kind of figure it out. And it's another thing where we say, let's get together and really put our heads and really identify what are some of the problems that are impacting people. How are people getting, how are people getting to parking and how are people actually spending their time parking? How does this impact the environment? And that's a broader conversation that I think if we continue to stay in a silo, we would miss those themes. And so it's really great to just have this level of collaboration to work together. Yeah, I, I, I just had a quick follow-up before I, I go to the remote uh, participants. Do we have any idea how many people just simply don't go downtown because of the angst of finding a parking spot? I mean, now it's probably not a problem, but it used to be a huge problem. Do we have any idea data-wise? I'm just curious. We, we have loose ideas and thoughts about that. I would definitely say that with COVID, things have changed quite of a bit. Um, which the other plug I would put in for this incredible public-private partnership is that we are also looking at ways to take advantages of traditional parking decks for the future because we can't predict where we're going to land, right, when, when folks come back into the offices, folks come back downtown. Um, so it opens up another level of kind of reuse in these existing parking structures to deploy, you know, batteries, to just deploy logistic hubs, mo micro-mobility hubs. Um, so it's going to be really exciting, but in terms of folks coming downtown, it is one of the, the common things I can say as part of the family of companies downtown that we hear a lot of angst about from our own team members. And so okay. it, we don't have actual specific data mm -hmm. on that, mm -hmm. but we have a lot of anecdotal data that people don't like trying to find parking. Um, Mandy, I'm going to go to you next. If you could tell us about the private-public par partnerships that are that were spawned and some that already existed that were re-energized with the Smart Columbus program. Sure. For us, um, I mean, the USDOT Smart City Challenge was really a demonstration program, but we approached it from a sustainability um, lens where we really wanted to leverage the award um, as seed funds for a long-term approach to solving mobility challenges um, and other challenges in our community. And so the public-private partnership that led the, the um, work of the Smart City Challenge was between the City of Columbus and the Columbus Partnership, which is a private sector organization 
uh, that is made up of, of about the top 75 CEOs in Central Ohio, so nationwide CEO, Columb Cardinal Health, AEP. Um, and so we really, that was our key, lever key partner. And if you look at the program, we really had to engage the private sector in order to make um, progress in our program. Specifically, AEP came to the table and worked to transition some of their um, coal-fired and gas-powered generation to wind and solar, uh, really trying to decrease emissions. Uh, if you look at all of our mobility program projects, we had to really partner with organizations that were trusted in order to recruit participants. And so that's our, our public private partnerships were, you know, umbrella and they were vast, but they also really leveraged some of those trusted organizations like St. Stephen's Community House, like uh, step one to get to our moms to be to recruit them into our prenatal trip assistance application uh, program. Uh, so it was imperative that we had the private sector, not just at the table, but hooked arm in arm with us so that we could really demonstrate that this technology would work and then ultimately um, scale and look at other opportunities to make impact, have impact in our community. Thank you, Mandy. And, and Gabe, I'd like to put that same question about you know, P3 to you as well and you know, some experiences or successes and, and really what makes that so successful? Yeah. Well, thanks, Carlin. I have to go back, I mean, gosh, 20 years to my experience with Zipcar you know, working on on-street uh, spaces uh, with cities and um, bike share programs where we played with different business models to work with the private sector on the government side, um, where we shifted more responsibility to them, uh, shared rewards, shared downside. Um, you know, right now uh, in my firm, City5, we're working with a company called Automotus. We're working with a number of cities on actually starting to pay for loading zone use, uh, but pay by the minute and then incrementally increase the cost. So it's, it's about cities being willing to alter their policy to actually help the fleets to be more successful and to pay less in tickets and more in fees. Um, and then uh, the Pittsburgh Mo Mobility Collective, which is formerly called Move 412. You can go to move412.com. We worked on that for the last couple of years, led by SPIN um, and, uh, and the, the Department of, of Mobility uh, and Innovation or an infrastructure, excuse me, in Pittsburgh. And we have Waze Carpool and we have the local transit authority and Zipcar and local uh, bike share, a nonprofit and transit app and a bunch of folks working together to provide an open garden versus a closed walled garden um, where you can plug and play as many providers as possible and have it virtually integrated in the cloud and physically virtually uh, uh, integrated with 50 hubs around the city with charging and all uh, uh, different configurations of the services. And then last, I would just say like uh, our work with the Knight Foundation, you know, working with four cities, right now we're working with KiwiBot on robot delivery for people that really need it. Um, and, you know, I think it shows that NGOs and, and philanthropy can play a really uh, important role in testing new technologies in cities with the private sector, but with the cities driving it versus it just being driven by the private sector where it's like, hey, give us a permit and let us operate. So lots of great stuff um, happening out there uh, right now and historically. Thanks, Gabe. Can we just talk for a moment about technology to improve the lives of the citizens versus technology for technology's sake? Um, you know, being a, a geeky engineer, and I, I've probably said this to many people before, you know, I, I just love technology. I think things are great. And we see, you know, temples of technology in cities that this technology was put in and it was absolutely useless. So, you know, again, we talk about these public-private partnerships. How can we solve that gap? Because the private sector has all these great solutions. The cities have problems. How, how can we do a better job of melding those? What, what do the businesses sitting here in this conference need to understand if they're gonna approach a municipality? And, uh, okay, Gabe. <laughs> I'll be brief, but the companies out there sometimes are scared of government, and I understand that. Um, I found government extremely frustrating before I worked there, and even sometimes when I worked there, I did too. Um, but co-creating is really what we need to do right now. Um, you know, Ford's on stage. I think they've been really great at co-creating with cities and being open-minded and listening. 
And there are a lot of companies out there that are, and they are working with cities on pilots um, with the hope that they'll scale into something sustainable, focused on outcomes that the city wants, because cities basically share the same DNA with some dif- some minor differences. Um, and I think that's the future, and that's it also helps speed to market. But the government needs to understand that the private sector does have to also make money, and there has to be a pathway to scale and profitability. Uh, it can't be one-sided, and that's a lot of the a lot of what I work on. Mandy. Carla, I would echo um, some of Gabe's sentiments, and I would also say that private sector, when you're coming in for a meet and greet, um, ask us what some of the, show us your product, you know, give us a little bit of information, um, let us uh, tell you what some of our pain points are, and really tailor the conversation around your product if it fits uh, to help us solve those challenges. We're doing that right now with Vision Zero. We uh, started, we wrapped up our plan at the end of March. We had a number of companies approach us to use uh, different technologies for predictive analytics around uh, preventing crashes. And so we've been doing great reviews. We sent them our plan, actually Ford was one of them. Um, and came in and they're sharing their ideas and they're being very specific. And that's that would be my recommendation is to be very specific um, and also co-create. Uh, that's definitely a great way. Thanks, and Justine, Ford's been mentioned twice, so you must have something to say. Yeah, I do. Um, and first, I just always like to remind folks that technology is a tool, right? And so in many ways, I think we need to remember that its purpose is a tool, but how can we use this tool to really think about making a change and making a difference? Um, within Ford, we have our city solutions team that works really closely with cities. I'm based in Los Angeles. We have a number of mobility strategists like myself located all throughout the United States. Um, we even have a team called the City One team that works really closely, um, you know, I'd say at the hyper-local level with cities, right? And so when you think about some of the work that they do, it's um, really through a, a, a challenge that they have, a City One challenge, where they do a year-long engagement process. Really before it's about, before having a conversation of here's a mobility solution that works, let's identify what are the problems. Um, let's not go into this conversation with an assumption that um, we, know the answers to what every city is dealing with. Every city is very unique. Even at the community level, it is very unique. Um, And, you know, one of the great things that that team does is really take the time to get to know the local players, the underserved populations that are typically not in the room. They utilize a community-centered approach to having this conversation to really think about what are some of the problems that are impacting communities and how can we bring the city along with us in this conversation to really uncover some of these issues. Um, It's really exciting work that we've done with our City One Challenge team in cities like Austin, Texas. Um, And in Miami, for example, just kind of two that come to mind at the immediate moment. And really through those challenge opportunities, we've really, um, one, came up with like understanding cities that were saying, you know, from a um, in visually impaired and hearing impaired community had a hard time moving around, right? And what are mobility solutions that can help these particular community members who are not just unique to Austin, but all around the world? And that's how you start creating technology that actually is serving people. Um, also similar work we've done in terms of food delivery and really thinking about how certain communities are isolated from fresh fruits and vegetables. And all of this is tied to mobility. And it's and it's not one of those things where it's like, oh, that's a cool product, but how can we create this ecosystem where we're talking about mobility in a way in which we're, we're linking that to innovation, we're linking that to really changing and improving the livelihoods that people have every day, and we want to make things better. So our approach is really not to go into a city and drop technology off, but our approach is really to work closely with cities to co-develop and co-create um, different solutions to meet their needs. Heather, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I think the piece for us is that the co-creation model is incredibly important. And, you know, we're coming from the private sector and we're trying to engage those in the city and we're trying to listen to your point, listening to the community to understand what makes sense in these developments and how we think about, you know, what our city should look like and how we can shape it. So we tend to take, especially with technology and, you know, as a someone that's been in technology for over 20 years and clearly has an affinity for technology, 
my, what I always tell folks is the moment people notice the technology, something's probably wrong with it. And that's when things go south. So we look at Bedrock when we think about these collaborations are really about how do we build environments with a technology layer so that the technology might not necessarily be the thing that's in your face and it's available and you're seeing it, but it becomes something that's easily adaptable to the end user to want to use. And again, it goes back to the co-creation, right? I mean, it's there. I, I've certainly got opinions on what technology in a city should look like. The city of Detroit has ideas of what that should look like. But we have to meet in the middle for it to be truly usable and truly adaptable to our communities. So let let me um, kind of integrate a question from the audience with one that came up as we were giving our in introductory comments, and it was about the mobility ecosystem and the need to have kind of the right product for the right usage for the right person. So looking at that entire ecosystem of bicycles, scooters, you know, and as Gabe said, we need to use our feet, um, you know, all the way up through delivery vehicles. But, you know, a person, a question came in from the audience, that's great, but how are we going to have everybody be safe? Because we don't necessarily have our streets designed that way today. And we have people on scooters without helmets and you know, all kinds of things are happening because we don't have the right policies or the right safe roadway structure. So you know, how, how do we go about building this? I see Gabe's waving frantically, so I'm going to hand it to Gabe again since this, part of this question is spawned by your opening comments. Well, thanks, Carla. I think the reason you had me here is you know that I have opinions, right? So um, we have a, a, a roadway system in the U.S. that is way out of whack in that um, we need a balanced roadway system, just like everything needs to be balanced. You need a balanced diet, right? And um, we need a balanced road diet because we've got, you know, 95% of the space devoted to automobiles. And then we wonder why it doesn't feel safe to ride a bike or to walk. Uh, I live in Washington, D.C., where we have a great sidewalk system, but I'm always amazed when I go to other places. I go to Orlando or other places, and, like, you can't walk. You literally have to drive. And so we can't fault people for driving everywhere if they literally do not have a safe way to travel in any other manner. And just in, in closing, so I can let some other people talk, I would say that in my experience running the DOT in Chicago and in DC, it was a bit of chicken and the egg because you have to show demand for that space in some cases before you can start to, to uh, reallocate it, before people will believe that it's needed. Um, and then you also have to reallocate that space so that regular people will ride bikes or walk. I mean, they have like uh, something like 800 million uh, bike rides a year in Amsterdam. I mean, I'm, I'm off on this number, but it's something like that in like one death, right? Um, and our fatality rate is just through the roof for active mobility, but also automobile and everything else. We have as many um, deaths from uh, crashes on our roadways as we do from guns. So we have a particular cultural issue, but we can fix it. And we've got to, at some point, make the shift, which takes some bold political action as well. Mandy. Um, for us, the city of Columbus, we are that city that has been, you know, building for cars for for a very long time, uh, you know, since the 30s, 40s, 50s. And we, again, are making that shift to really focus on vision zero, focus on that, that safe system model. Um, I will tell you, I'm a traffic engineer. I've been taught highway capacity manual levels, A, B, C, D, F, you know, mm -hmm. career. And um, I'm at the forefront of this and I'm talking to other traffic engineers and we're trying to do traffic studies um, and prepare for the future. But how do you do that without considering um, they're still focused on levels A, B, C, D, and F. And so it, it's, it's time for that change, um, but change is hard because people are accustomed to following the manuals and the manuals are still uh, coming along uh, to represent, to be more representative of all road users. So we've got a ways to go. I know we can get there. And that's definitely where we're going to need great policy um, and people to really make those changes um, at, at my level and uh, at the engineering level. So Mandy, I have a question for you. I often say in, in my discussions, we need to turn urban planning upside down. You know, instead of designing our, our 
cities for vehicles, we need to design our cities for people and for livability, et cetera. Do we need to do the same thing with civil engineering? You're a civil engineer. Yes, we do. Um, I, I believe it. I believe I've heard all three of you say human centered or people focused. Um, when I was a civil engineer and I love Ohio State University, I never once heard my professors talk about why we were doing the work we were doing other than to solve a, a water, a transportation um, or a structural challenge. I didn't hear the social component of why we were building and why we were doing those things. So I think you have to start with a conversation um, in engineering about why we engineer. Um, we're engineering solutions for people. And that part has to be introduced into all the curricula. I think that's, we, we could take a whole session just on education and turning it around. Do you have any additional comments on this uh, ecosystem of, of roadways and structure? Yeah, I would just say, you know, just piggybacking off a lot of what my um, fellow panelists have said, I think design is very important, right? And, and I think even this pandemic in many ways has forced us to, to really look at design in a very different capacity. Our relationship with the curb has changed, right? Like, you know, instead of a curb where you're leaving your car all day long, this curb now turns into a delivery zone, right? And it turns into a, you know, a five minute pickup or drop off location. And so, it has allowed us to really have a very different conversation about land use. Um, and I think design is important because it does definitely hit onto the topic of safety. When we're designing our communities, our roadways, how are we prioritizing safety within that conversation? I'd also say accessibility, right? A lot of communities, to your point, may be designed or have been designed um, just for one type of mode. And what does design look like when we are talking about a variety of different modes, whether you are walking, whether you're in a wheelchair, whether you're on a scooter, whether you're using a walker, whether you're on a shuttle, how does that space start to feel safe from a design perspective that does incorporate more modes? I think when we think about our transportation system, redundancy is important. Um, and that's what creates resiliency. If we don't have redundant systems, when one line of, or the dominant mode of transportation goes down, what do you do? How do people move? How will they get to their families? How will they get to work? How will they get to ho their homes? Um, all of these conversations are very important. So I would say design and accessibility are, are, are really key um, to this conversation as well in terms of promoting an environment of safety. I, we think quite a bit about transportation design because part of what we hope to do is attract folks to come down to the downtown core in Detroit or in Cleveland in these great, wonderful cities that were built for automobiles. And so for us, we do a lot of a lot of predictive analytics that we're kind of like noodling together about how do we start to think about driving folks downtown to the you know to these these city center cores and when we think about designing these large developments what does that transportation layer look like and from there it becomes a conversation to something Gabe said earlier it's it, from a safety perspective it's policy it's policy driven right it's policy driven at the city and I would say the quick shout out to, we have a great government affairs team, and that is mission critical for a company like ours that is wanting to engage in these incredible public-private partnerships, is to have these strong relationships at the city so that we can think about our developments with a safety focus and a transportation focus. So I've had a few questions come in from the audience about EVs and how they integrate into the urban environment, and especially for those folks that are um, in a multi-unit dwelling. Um, how, how can they manage or what needs to change? Um, I think I was gonna raise it to Mandy just because of what I know you went through with the EVs. I see Gabe, but Gabe, I've gotten you first the last two times, so I'm gonna go to Mandy first. <laughs> Uh, Carla, um, we actually launched a multi-unit development um, charging program through Smart Columbus. We leveraged uh, Paul G. Allen Family Foundation funds uh, to co-fund uh, developer-installed uh, level two charging throughout the city. That helped us get to almost a thousand chargers overall throughout our entire city, most being or many being through the multi-unit development program. One of the things we still have to finish uh, that's beyond the program is modifying our building code. 
we are working on an EV ready ordinance to integrate into our building code so that residential and commercial uh, buildings um, at least think about allow the capacity in the electrical infrastructure as what and if they're not going to install it right now at least put in the conduit to run it later because it's much less expensive to to do it um, up front than retrofit. Uh, so there's really opportunity uh, to, to integrate it into that policy and into the building code. Okay, Gabe, I'll go to you next. <laughs> I'll be brief, I'll be brief. Uh, you know, um, there's not one solution, particularly in the intermediate phase where we're going from where we are to where we wanna be in let's say 10 or 15 years, but we need curbside charging stations in urban areas. Um, we need um, uh, shared mobility. Uh, rather than own mobility, which is what I was talking about when I, when I opened it. And it is hard with the land use that we have, but in multi-unit, um, multi-unit urban or inner ring suburban, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, big picture, when you look at the environmental devastation that we're facing and the price tag to clean it up, it would be cheaper to provide every single person in our metropolitan areas shared mobility and charge them like $200 a month tax and get rid of all the automobiles. I, I know this sounds crazy, but then what we're facing with the, you know, multi, multi, multi trillion dollar uh, bill to clean up uh, on the back end. And so we're going to get there. Uh, policymakers already realize it. It's just, it's, it's such a change from where we are now. Um, but we're going to have to get to shared because if everybody owns their own vehicle and tries to charge it, not only can the grid not support it, um, but it's unaffordable. So Heather, when, when you're looking at the future of, of parking and potentially this new shared economy where there may be fewer vehicles or vehicles circulating and, and not parking, are you thinking at all about any of these ex-parking garages turning into charging garages or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. I think everything's on the table right now, especially coming out of COVID and, and not having a clear picture into what usage uh, what usage will look like in the future. I mean, we know what it was, but we know that, that that landscape is changing. So when we think about kind of the opportunities we have ahead to re-envision what a parking deck could, should be, I mean, having, you know, at, you know, what does our EV strategy look like, right? I mean, I think developers that are getting smart about this are putting together very concrete strategy around what does EV look like to me and what does it look like to the community around me and how can that be used as an attraction model. So we, we think about that a lot. We also think about, to your point about batteries, you know, in these spaces, in these parking decks, if we find ourselves with extra space, something to transform into some other use, having battery charging, having logistic hubs, having kind of the things that we talked about at the AV, uh, at our at smart parking lab, like the ability in the future to have logistics, you know, to have uh, delivery vehicles come into our garages autonomously, park at an EV charging station, charge overnight, and then go about their merry way the next day is something I think all smart developers, folks that are really thinking about real estate and what the new, this new city, this new connected technology focused city, again, technology that you don't notice because if you notice it's probably broken, but technology that is useful and is also driving organizations like ours to a more sustainable model. Would you have anything you wanted to add or? I can move to the next. Yeah, just just two quick points. Um, you know, I'd say the conversation about land use is is very important to this topic of um, access to EV charging. Um, when we think about a lot of developments and we think about parking minimums, um, how might that conversation also consider um, EV charging as part of that? Um, I, I, I just think we'd be remiss not to talk about uh, just a lot of the land use policy that is not in alignment with a lot of the things that we're trying to do. But also, I would say there are a lot of cities right now that are trying to push that needle and that are, are really eager to really think about electrification and sustainability. Um, and lastly, I'll say accessibility is important. Um, and I'm going to continue to, to hit the, the drum on this one um, because there are so many communities um, now that it's really important, especially as we're having this conversation about um, zero emission vehicles, especially, you know, over a period of time 
making sure that communities do have access to charging stations are going to be important, especially in public locations. I think Gabe mentioned that as well as within um, apartment buildings, within a lot of different types of uses is going to be important. Great. And I want to go back a little bit to the economic opportunity. And there's a couple things I want to touch upon. One is um, in the film that was shown earlier, it was said, you know, because we've uh, in, done all of these things to make Columbus smart, um, we've had X number of companies choose to invest here. Um, and then also there is a question from the audience about what about these underserved communities? If we give them the technology and they have more opportunity, will that lead to improved property values and improved um, attractiveness of some of these collapsing communities, so to speak? And how do you not become kind of the, the um, ghost town of the, of the 2030s, let's say? So how do we link this technology to our economic engine is, is my question. And uh, anybody want to tackle that first? Heather. Yeah, I think, and this is a, just a very quick point on that. I think open access to internet and, and moving that out into our neighborhoods and our communities is going to be incredibly important. I mean, internet is access to the world. It is access to education. It is access to data. And if we can't open up internet access to underserved communities and spread that throughout throughout our neighborhoods, it's going to be very difficult. So I, I really see the propagation of open and available Wi-Fi as something that will absolutely drive economic activity. Um, I would also just add to that uh, that I think you know, we have to have a conversation about jobs and workforce development, and we talk about spurring economic opportunity. Mobility in many ways and transportation in many ways is that thread that connects people from their housing to employment or the possibility of employment if they don't have employment now. And it's really important that we think about that thread and how it weaves through different people's lives. Um, it's important to have the conversation with underserved populations. If you, again, drop off technology and you think people are gonna use it or you think it's gonna make their livelihood better, that's a false narrative. And really, we have to be inclusive of those ideas. We have to give power to the people who have their own power and, and they know their communities, right? They can tell you what they need. They'll tell you that bus stop there doesn't make sense. They'll tell you that that bike lane there, or lack thereof, is causing people issues when we talk about people taking different modes. I think that's a big component of economic mobility as well in terms of this discussion about economic development. Um, so I think the workforce uh, component is very important as well, and how do we connect people to the jobs of the future? How might we create this pipeline? We're having this conversation about technology, but who's the, the masterminds in many ways of thinking about and developing this technology, also down to the people who manufacture the technology and sell the technology, and there is a role for everyone to play here. Um, I think we just need to start bringing bringing more people into that conversation. Yeah, I loved your comment about broadband as kind of the basis, right? And you know, I mentioned it during my talk with the governor, you know, students that didn't have broadband, I can only imagine what they've gone through over the past, you know, 18 months or so. Gabe, comment. Yeah. Well, I, I agree uh, strongly with uh, with our, my two other panelists, but I, I would say you know, big picture culturally, we need to figure out in this country what we are going to define as a privilege versus a right. Um, and I think broadband, uh, as Heather said, is a great example of something that in, in modern times without broadband, you do not have the same opportunity, right? You do not have the same uh, uh, potential for income. And so I would say transportation and access is the exact same thing. Um, and for those of you that say, wow, well, Gabe sounds like a bit of a socialist. Uh, the thing is, is that from a capitalist standpoint, you have to look at the return on investment. You know, we have no problem spending 70 grand a year to incarcerate people, but we won't spend 30 grand a year to give people college education, right? So look at the return, the social uh, uh, return or costs, look at the full return 30 year on the investments that we make in people versus just what we call spending. And uh, we can make much better decisions, fiscal decisions. Do you have any comment, Mandy, or? 
Yeah, I'd love to invite people to check out, um, link us. Um, our, um, it's our mobility initiative here in Columbus. And Carly, you specifically asked, you know, do we just give people the technology and it get, immediately gives them more access? I, I agree with all the comments around uh, broadband and, and internet access. Um, I think we are really focused on uh, transportation investments, broadband investments, um, mixed income housing, so affordable housing investments, and really um, ensuring that we're looking at the, um, the systemic problems and challenges that we're facing and bringing and looking at the solutions in a holistic picture. It's, it's fun. Planners have been talking about this for decades. I've been working with planners and uh, we've got planners and engineers and policymakers and uh, community leaders and residents at the table. And we're really focused on um, leveraging transportation investment um, but bringing everything else that goes with a great place um, and a great community to the table to in, or, in order to make sure that we're thinking through this correctly. So check out Link House Columbus. Thanks, Mandy. And I have one final question, and it came from, it started from a, a question submitted by the audience, which was what's on the horizon in terms of new technology. But I want to take it a, a little step further and when we think about how fast technology is, is evolving today, I mean, it's, it's just at an exponential pace, and cities don't tend to invest at that kind of pace or move at that kind of pace. So, you know, what is new on the horizon, and how can cities think about adapting with this new technology to stay relevant? What, what, what needs to be different in the way that we do things as, as, a, as a city? Mandy, your hand's up. I'll let I'm you say. <laughs> go ahead and start, then I'm gonna go to Gabe and then the two panelists on the stage and we'll end the sessions. I'm sorry to interrupt. No worries. I'm gonna say um, what's new is what's old. And for the first time, we're working to organize and manage our data and make sure that it is accessible. And that gives us incredible insights into our community um, and to, into how we do our work so that we can uh, really serve our residents better. And without really focusing on the data and the systems that you have, you really can't do as many of the things that you're gonna to wanna to do with all the new technology coming down the, the pipeline. It doesn't mean we're stuck. It doesn't mean we can't try anything, but we have to really focus on the foundational information and systems that we have. <clears throat> um, and I'll just say, I mean, I talked about electrification and all the other sub industries that that's going to spawn are gonna be amazing. Um, augmented reality is gonna be very interesting from the standpoint of wayfinding um, I still believe 3D printing. I mean, we just we started talking about it really early, uh, uh, you know, five, six, to seven years ago. But it is going to change the way we manufacture and hopefully allow us to uh, create light duty manufacturing jobs a lot, a lot closer to uh, where people live. Um, and last, I would just say um, mobility wallets and, and 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 just I mean, the whole finance sector is changing. Let people pay however they want to pay, but let's provide people a centralized wallet where we can provide them with mobility and let them choose how they want to get around. And I think that's that's coming. It doesn't quite exist yet. There's a lot of aggregation apps, but I think the uh, the wallet is, is going to be coming soon. Thank you. Justine. Sure. I'll actually give a perspective from, I guess you'd say, a, a government or city point of view. Um, and I'll say that being, I'm seeing a lot of cities and, and as well as states doing things like open solicitation for, for bids. And really that's one way of staying up to speed in terms of what's going on. And I know that municipalities have a lot that they are um, working through every single day with very limited resources and very bureaucratic, right? And so I think that's one way to break the bureaucracy, but also to figure out what's new, what's happening with technology. Um, I'm in Los Angeles and there's an organization called Urban Movement Labs, which is essentially doing great work around urban proving ground. So essentially where might there be test beds within uh, the city to look at things like a technology innovation zone. And, and you think about that, that's really dynamic, but that's a great way for technology and mobility providers to play in a space. It allows the city to learn very quickly. And it also, you have a conversation about how might that scale to multiple places within a city. So I think it's really these um, different actions that a lot of cities are taking um, that will actually help to enable cities to actually 
keep up to speed with what's happening with technology. Of course, it's evolving. Today, it looks like one thing. Next week, it may be very, something very different. But there is definitely a way in which the city can start to intake some of that information. Great, and Heather, your closing thoughts. Yeah, I would, I would say the piece to kind of echo a statement earlier is that data is going to be everything. The sensors that you have that define the space in which you exist in and the, the little pieces of data that we can get that to then drive decision makings to make that space better, to make the lighting brighter, to make, the, to make it cooler or warmer. I think that is going to become more and more significant. And with that, as a, you know, in the private sector, things that will really become forefront, especially in Michigan, is, is how are we handling and holding consumer data? And how are we safeguarding that and making sure that we are doing right by our tenants, our residents, and those that use our technology and ex exist in our spaces. Well, thank you so much. I had a ton more questions, but we're out of time. I appreciate the panelists' thoughts. You were an excellent panel. Audience was great with all your questions. Let's give a round of applause to the panelists. And off to a few minutes of break time. Thank you so much.